Welcome to the New Books Network. Hi, you're listening to New Books and in Intellectual History. I'm your host, Dexter Fergie. I'm a PhD student at Northwestern University. Today I'll be speaking with Lawrence Glickman, a historian and the Stephen and Evelyn Millman Professor in American Studies at Cornell University. We will be discussing his brand new book, Free Enterprise, an American History. Free enterprise is an everyday phrase that connotes an American common sense. We see it everywhere from political speeches to pop culture. Some commentators even call Christopher Columbus and the Pilgrims free enterprisers. In his new book, Free Enterprise, Glickman analyzes that phrase's historical meaning and shows just how it became common sense. Glickman traces the phrase from its many 19th century meanings, including its associations with abolitionism and free labor, to its conservative reformulation in the 1920s and 30s. It's a remarkable, deeply researched book that offers much to intellectual history, political history, and the history of capitalism. I hope you enjoy our conversation. I'm speaking with Lawrence Glickman about his fascinating new book, Free Enterprise. Thanks so much for joining me today. Uh, Thank you for having me, Dexter. Yeah, I I really enjoyed the book, uh, and I'm thrilled that we're getting a chance to talk about it. Um, so we always start our, uh, our our interviews off with the same question. How did you end up becoming a historian? Well, that's a great question. Uh, I think part there, there's a long-term story and a shorter-term story. The long-term story is that I loved reading about history as a kid, but really had no idea that it was something you could do for a profession. Um, and I was very lucky that my freshman year at Princeton University, I kind of as a lark, took a course taught by Sean Wilentz called American Social History. And that course introduced introduced me to all kinds of uh, historical topics that I hadn't studied in my high school curriculum. Uh, You know, we talked about working class history and the history of enslaved people and women's history. And uh, it really blew my mind how history could tell the story of ordinary people from the bottom up, how there was still a lot we didn't know about history uh, or we're just learning. And um, I decided to become a history major. Up until that point, I thought I would go to law school. And I remember around my junior year, I think, I asked Professor Wilentz, you know, how do you get that job that you have uh, being a professor? And he told me, I mean, I kind of knew a little bit about graduate school, but not that much. And he told me about that. And then I decided to... uh, to uh, go to graduate school because I loved the history courses I took as an undergrad, and I particularly loved uh, researching and writing in history, and I thought it would be a great opportunity to continue that process. Well, that's actually really lovely because Sean Bowens is one of your blurbers for this book. Yes. Yeah. It came full circle. I was so delighted that they asked him to do so and that he agreed to because he really was... uh, one of the people who inspired me uh, to go into the field of history. Well, that's fantastic. Uh, And what brought you to the topic of this book, uh, Free Enterprise? Yeah, that's also has a long-term and a short-term answer, I guess. The long-term answer is that the very first day I started my first job as a professor at the University of South Carolina, um, I remember I was unpacking boxes in my office. It was before the start of the semester. And a student came by just to introduce himself. And he said to me, don't you think the reason America is so great is because of our free enterprise system? Now, you have to keep in mind, I had just moved from Berkeley, California, only a few days earlier. uh, And uh, that wasn't a sentence I would have ever expected to hear in Berkeley. Um, And uh, it got me thinking about why people use that term free enterprise system, what they meant by it. And I remember asking him, uh, although I don't remember his answer, uh, what he meant by that term. But I kind of had it in the back of my mind that it was something that would be interesting uh, to study. Um, And then two things over the course of my research career, much later on, got me on the topic. The first was that when I was researching the history of consumer activism, Uh, I came across the term free enterprise in the context of 19th century abolition. Abolitionists used the term free enterprise in contradistinction to slave enterprises, that is, businesses that were dependent on uh, 
the labor of enslaved people. They use the term free enterprise to talk about businesses built on free labor. And uh, that was really one of the early uses of the term in American history uh, in the 1830s and 40s. But then probably the main thing that spurred me to write this book is um, after I finished my study of consumer activism, I was working on issues of public spending and consumption. And um, I began to research debates about public spending in the United States in the post-war years. And one of the terms that I often found by people who opposed a public spending agenda was free enterprise. They contrasted free enterprise with public spending. That wound up being the subject of the final chapter of my book, but um, I didn't know it at the time. But I began to decide, I, I decided that studying this sort of vague but seemingly all pervasive notion of free enterprise might be more interesting than the topic of public spending. So I kind of abandoned that topic and turned to the history of free enterprise. Well, uh, your, yeah, your, your book does a lot with the phrase free enterprise, and you've already kind of uh, um, uh, talked a little bit about um, the 19th century uh, use of that term, but you go all the way up to the present. Uh, and the major portion of the book examines um, the conservative project to redefine that phrase in the early 20th century um, to make it um, uh, more tied to things like markets and the business community. Um, uh, and then uh, during the New Deal order to turn it into common sense. Yes. Uh, and I was so fascinated by this idea of common sense as almost like a historical object, you know, how actors constructed it, how it can achieve um, political ends. Um, and so my, uh, I just have a methodological question for you. How can a historian write the history of common sense? Yeah, that's a great question. And I gave a lot of thought to that. By the way, I was very influenced by uh, Sophia Rosenfeld's book called Common Sense, uh, which is a wonderful treatment of the kind of intellectual history of that idea um, in the 18th century and into the 19th. Uh, but one of the things that frustrated me when I began grad school, which was the acme of the new cultural history, that moment, and the new cultural history it struck me was all about the new, the obscure, the things that, as Robert Darnton said in his book, The Great Cat Massacre, what cultural historians should study is the joke that we don't understand. And in his case, he was trying to understand why a group of Parisian artisans thought it was hilarious that they had murdered uh, a, a number of cats of their mean uh, overseer, the person who ran their shop. Um, and he, you know, he, that was his paradigmatic example of what cultural history should do. And while I thought that was interesting, uh, to me, there is so much buried in things that we take for granted. And I think so much of the historical project is about uh, denaturalizing things that we take for granted, trying to understand them uh, uh, afresh by looking at them maybe from a different angle. Often that angle is historical. You know, when did this term come into use? What did it mean when it came into use? What were some of the debates about the meaning of a term that we don't debate anymore? Uh, this was a really important thing for me. Uh, I remember reading Peter Novick's great book on the objectivity question in American history uh, that came out, I think, in the late 1980s. And uh, Novick says something in his introduction along these lines as well that, uh, you know, he's studying, he's studying something in his case, objectivity that we all think we understand, but that actually is super hard to define. And I kind of uh, was influenced by, by that model and wanted to pursue it myself. I don't know in answer to your specific question if I really have a, a great methodological uh, answer to your, to your question about that. But I, I, you know, for me, my technique is often to uh, look at the history of terms. You know, my first book was about the idea of the living wage. And a lot of it was sort of tracing, when did people start using this term? And uh, isn't it significant that they started using it in the 1870s rather than, you know, I don't know, the 1840s or the 1920s? Um, and with my work on boycotts, I was also interested in that term when it came about um, in, in 1880, 
And for this project, uh, it seems super important to do that because people, even historians, use the term free enterprise without defining it. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I wanted to go beyond that. Excuse me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and so, I mean, yeah, your, your, your um, method methodology is actually really interesting uh, and it seems very laborious. Uh, I mean, I was um, just going through the, the footnotes and uh, the amount of material that you went through for this book is just astounding. <laughs> but I guess like when you're talking about common sense, it's so diffuse, it's, um, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of everywhere. And so, um, you know, you you looked for quotidian documents, I think, as you say, at one point. Yeah, yeah. You know, one of the things I wanted to do was write an intellectual history of people and ideas that, at least until recently, most intellectual historians wouldn't have been interested in, because I'm not looking at canonical thinkers, I'm looking at really people who were mostly publicists, you might even call them propagandists, uh, mostly second order intellectuals. Um, but I think these types of people are very influential and uh, they are often people who don't leave behind an archive. They might leave behind an op-ed or a sermon or a political speech. Um, and so I thought it was my job to kind of track these things down to the extent that I could. And, uh, you know, I'm really lucky that I'm writing this book. I wrote this book in the last decade when, you know, so many um, sources uh, are now available online that weren't available previously. Uh, you know, using newspaper uh, resources was one of the central things that I that I did in this project. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to talk about the argument itself now. Um, sure. And so uh, the idea of free enterprise, um, you know, became common sense. Uh, but what's really interesting about this is just how radical. Um, the idea of free enterprise actually was, um, you know, for many of your actors, that meant um, rolling back the welfare state, um, rolling back, um, you know, any of the New Deal provisions. Um, and so just a really um, uh, a broad sweeping question uh, that I hope you can handle uh, relatively quickly. How did <laughs> free enterprise uh, come to be seen as common sense? Well, that is, I, you know, to me, the $64,000 question of my book. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of it, I think, has to do with winning the narrative. Um, you know, what story is going to be compelling? And part of it, um, as I try to argue, was simply repetition. Uh, this term, this phrase was used over and over again. And uh, the arguments of free enterprisers from the start of the New Deal in 1933, through the late 70s, I would say, was uh, virtually unchanging. And so I think what happened was that uh, an argument that first was a minority argument, because most Americans really supported the New Deal and were in favor of it. Um, but that argument diffused into the culture, even when most Americans didn't buy it. Uh, as the New Deal became increasingly um, uh, unpopular, as the New Deal coalition split apart and so forth, I think it got more purchase and uh, it was already familiar. You know, it wasn't like you had to make a new argument in 1973. You could make an old argument, but now it had a broader audience. And that uh, my first chapter of the book, I decided to almost start at the end uh, because I wrote about this uh document famous among some people. I call it famous, but I realize a lot of people don't know about it. Uh, I called, know about it. <laughs> right. I know you did, but uh, yeah. <laughs> but it's called the Powell Memo, uh, which was uh, a memorandum written by Lewis Powell, uh, who was a corporate lawyer shortly to ascend to the Supreme Court only a few months later. He wrote this in August 1971. Um, and it's called The Attack on the American Free Enterprise System. He wrote it as a confidential memorandum Eventually, it leaked out and became public. And a lot of historians over the last 10 or 15 years have looked at it as a real turning point in American history. Uh, but my argument is actually what Powell did was really just the culmination of this four decade long free enterprise critique of New Deal thinking. Great. 
Um, and so uh, what's really interesting about um, this, uh, this, this new common sense that comes about in, in the 20th century is just how different it was from um, the use of free enterprise in the 19th century. And again, you've already kind of touched on how abolitionists were using this term, um, but I thought you could uh, maybe uh, say a bit more about um, uh, like what a 19th century American would have meant by uh, free enterprise. Yeah, it's a really interesting story. Uh, I would say the main thing that I observed is that for most of the 19th century, one of the dominant meanings of free enterprise was as an attribute. So a lot of politicians and city boosters and so forth would talk about unleashing the spirit of free enterprise. Um, so free enterprise wasn't a thing. Uh, it wasn't a system as it became understood in the 20th century. It was really an attribute. And um, you know, the first use I found of it, uh, of the term was President Andrew Jackson using the term in an address in December, 1832. And um, he used it in that way as an attribute. And what's interesting about it was that uh, many people, including Jackson, talked about the role of the state in helping unleash free enterprise. Uh, you know, this was the era of nation building and canals and infrastructure projects and so forth. And so it's kind of interesting because it's quite distinct from the, um, the vision that becomes dominant in the 20th century, which is very anti-statist. This vision of free enterprise um, included a place, at least many people who used it, included a place for kind of robust state involvement as um, consistent with and symbiotic even with uh, the spirit of free enterprise. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and that is just so different than, um, yeah, the reformulation in the 20th century, or at least the conservative reformulation, where they're almost enemies. Uh, the, the state and free enterprise are these enemies locked in combat. Exactly. Um, and uh, so can I just follow up with one thing about that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. The one, th I mean, one observation that I, that I had about this is that um, the terms free enterprise and free labor were important in the 19th century, but free enterprise was sort of a, a subset of the broader uh, free labor ideology. Um, and uh, they, they were, kind of closely related to each other. One of the things I observed that is that in the 20th century, they flipped and uh, uh, many more people spoke about free enterprise with free labor being a part of the broader free enterprise system, but definitely a subordinate part. Whereas in the 19th century, it was really flipped that uh, free enterprise was sort of an attribute that free laborers had. It was an attribute of, of, of a healthy free labor system. Uh, and because free enterprise in the 20th century became much more associated with, say, entrepreneurs and small business firms than with uh, individual laborers, I thought that uh, flipping was telling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's very telling, and it um, uh, it tells a lot about just like U.S. history more broadly. Um, uh, yeah, the. Uh, decline of the working class, the, this like ideological uh, endorsement of capitalism. It's 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 a uh, a really uh, important reversal. Um, so, I want to talk about this reformulation, uh, and uh, you know there are several people um, who you cover in this book who uh, um, are involved in reformulating this idea of free enterprise. Um, but one person um, that I think might be a good uh, um, window onto these changes is um, Merle Thorpe, uh -huh. uh, the ed the editor of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce's uh, in-house magazine, um, and uh, and so he's someone that you write about um, a fair amount in the earlier chapters. And so, how did this guy help modify the meaning of free enterprise? Yeah, I think Thorpe is really important. Uh, one of the things I expected to find when I began to research this was that the kind of modern notion of free enterprise, uh, which arose uh, in the 20th century, my guess was that it emerged in contradistinction to the New Deal, mm -hmm. uh, which it certainly flourished in that period, but it actually emerged about a decade earlier in the 1920s. And I think Merle Thorpe was one of the key people 
uh, who was, uh, you know, the editor, as you mentioned, of Nation's Business, this very important journal of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Um, and I think he was one of the key people, uh, not the only person, but sort of rethinking free enterprise. And he was one of the people who helped um, shift it from the idea of this attribute that you know, individuals in a healthy free labor society possessed to uh, a quality of the business firm and uh, particularly the organized business community. Um, and uh, he introduced so many uh, elements that uh, became sort of standard part of free enterprise ideology a little bit later on. But when he did it, he was really, I think, formulating something new uh, you know, such as the idea that uh, even though he valorized the entrepreneur and the small businessman and so forth, he also talked about the need for business to unite and to uh, uh, to kind of work in concert with each other through lobbies like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, for example, um, as a way of promoting their interests in society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's it's a it's a really interesting uh, moment because it's almost like the this like growing class consciousness am among business leads, uh, and it's it's this other feature of the the marketplace. And so you know you have this competition between capitalists, but then you also have this collaboration at a political level, uh, and free enterprise is kind of like an ideological touchstone for that. So. Uh, yeah, the, the the New Deal is another um, big part of this book, um, and you were just talking about how this reformulation um, almost or what happened before the New Deal. But you you make another argument in the book that um, the New Deal order and the age of free enterprise um, shouldn't be seen as um, like distinct epochs. Um, that like or or you, we shouldn't see it as like the New Deal um, order followed by the conservative backlash. Um, that we need to think of these things as uh, um, as united in some sort of a dialectic. Can you walk readers through this um, bold historiographical point? <laughs> sure, absolutely. Yeah, I think that, um, and I, I'm certainly not the only historian to say this, but ever since uh, the, I think, 1989 book by edited by Steve Fraser and Gary Gerstle called The Rise and Fall of the New Deal Order, um, I think there's been this conception of a kind of neatly packaged periodization in which you have the New Deal reigning hegemonic. Now, people differ on when that ended, you know, began, say, with the election of Franklin Roosevelt. In their book, they say it died with the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980. Other historians have said, no, it really died in 1968 or 1971 or what have you. Um, and I guess while I really... Um, I think that work is super important, and I use the concept of the New Deal order a lot. I think it's really important to not overemphasize the degree to which uh, the New Deal order kind of reigned unchallenged, because from the very beginning, there were very serious challenges to the New Deal, which shaped it in fundamental ways. And so the way I think about it is that free enterprise always needs an other. And for most of its history, at least in the modern sense, the other for free enterprise was the New Deal. And um, they were, um, you know, had different amounts of relative strength at different times, but free enterprise uh, challenges to the New Deal were important throughout even the 30s and 40s. Um, you know, periods that we think of as, you know, the high point of New Deal consensus in American history. Um, but conversely, I think it's also the case that, say, in the, you know, what Sean Willens calls the age of Reagan, the period after the election of Ronald Reagan, when conservative ideas seem dominant, um, I think it's important to realize that the New Deal uh, order, New Deal concepts um, are uh, still vying with uh, the conservative ones, which, uh, you know, became dominant, but again, were never unchallenged. So I guess the, w the way that I think about it is um, as a constant tension with, uh, with different levels of power, but that the two uh, have to be looked at in relation to each other. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, the um, the free enterprisers almost gain their power um, from this, like this sense of uh, being under siege. Uh, this is like a common a common trope in in the book um, that you know you have these um, you know business leaders, these people that are extremely powerful. Uh, they operate uh, you know corporations, or you also have um, you know, small businessmen, uh, and uh, and they just like constantly feel like uh, they're existentially threatened. Uh, and you call this uh, elite victimization. Uh, do you want to say something about that? Yeah, um, I think it's really important. Uh, one of the things that I was surprised to find is that free enterprise, which I guess when I started this project, I thought of it mostly in its economic register and maybe a little bit in its political uh, register. But what I discovered in my book was that you really need to think about the psychological register <laughs> and the idea of... Um, of powerful people feeling bereft and victimized and that they're about to lose a struggle and that it's an existential war um, is something that is absolutely essential to free enterprise uh, discourse. Um, you know, one of the things I just did a tweet storm today about the idea of free enterprise being under attack because Senator David Perdue uh, recently posted a tweet saying free enterprise was under attack. And uh, what I showed is that pretty much any decade since the 1930s, you can find dozens of people saying that. There's really no point when free enterprise isn't under attack. Almost definitionally, uh, what it required was a feeling that um, the situation was dire and desperate. And um, I think that explains so much about our political uh, vocabulary and the way in which um, the, what often, I mean, as you, you kind of said in introducing this, what might not at first make sense, like why would powerful, wealthy people who were doing well, even under the New Deal, uh, why would they feel so threatened, uh, but threatened they were, at least they felt that way, and I think that um, that was really central to their to the power of their message was that it wasn't simply sort of a rational uh, uh, set of claims. It was a deeply emotional set of claims. And it was a set of claims about people being bereft, being aggrieved, being endangered of uh, being wiped out in some sense. <laughs> Yeah, do, do you have a um, an example of someone, uh, a particularly uh, histrionic one, maybe? Well, I think you know the uh, the kind of ur text of this. I think is Lewis Powell's <laughs> memo that I spoke of earlier. And you have to remember, as I try to say in the book, Lewis Powell. Uh, even though a lot of people who look at the Powell memo and say it's such an extremist document, it's a blueprint for the corporate takeover of America and so forth. But um, Lewis Powell was. Um, you know, considered himself to be a very moderate personality. Um, but um, he said in that document that, um, you know, the hour is late. Uh, you know, free enterprise is in danger and the hour is late. I think that was something like the last line of the memo. Um, so um, this was 1971. Richard Nixon was the president. Um, there had been some, you know, uh, a wave of kind of consumer and regulatory legislation in the late 60s, early 70s. There was the EPA and so forth. But it doesn't strike me as a historian that capitalism was uh, in tremendous danger at that point. But that's what Powell wrote and that's what he felt. And um, and so, you know, that's only one of about a million examples I can give you. Another one is uh, Ronald Reagan's uh, speech against Medicare uh, which he gave in the early 1960s. And, you know, he had a famous line in there about how if we don't stop this now, uh, our children and our children's children will not know the taste of freedom and will be the last people to have experienced what freedom means. Uh, I'm paraphrasing here, but he said something along those lines. Um, and what's interesting to me about this discourse is that uh, the predictions are always wrong. Uh, but, uh, that doesn't stop the next set of predictions from happening when the next threat is, uh, you know, is assessed.
And so there's kind of, there's almost an endless loop quality to this. Yeah, that, 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 that really comes through in your book. Um, the, the rhetoric of free enterprise um, seems to just be fixed. Uh, and so you have, you know, tons of changes between uh, 1930 and the 1970s, but um, like the, the, the rhetoric um, seems to almost just be stagnant. Um, yeah, and I would say that that was a huge challenge for me historiographically, because we are taught as historians, as you know, to look at change over time. And uh, what I was finding was really a shocking lack of change over time in terms of the structure of the rhetoric, some of the exact same vocabulary, um, you know, like, for example, free enterprises under attack, as I said, you could find that phrase uh, word for word, uh, you know, in every decade between the 30s and today. Um, so what I realized, one of the things I say in the book is that although the text didn't change very much, the context changed a lot. And so that's, I think, one of the ways that I try to, to address this issue of change over time with a, a discourse that was really as a, you know, kind of frozen in amber almost once it, <laughs> once it developed. Uh, and it was really a challenge for me as a historian. I wasn't used to that. I wasn't expecting that. And I didn't quite know what to do with it because I thought maybe I'm failing as a historian if I'm not finding change over time. That's what we're paid to do after all. Yeah, no, I, I think that continuity is uh, is just as important. Um, and I think that um, you you ended up uh, organizing the chapters along thematic lines. And I think that was the, uh, um, the, the, the way to go. Oh, well, yeah. I you thought so. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, that's kind of how I, I decided to approach that. Issue, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, I want to continue. I'm um, sort of like deconstructing this ideology, um, and so yeah, we have this uh, elite victimization. Um, but this other aspect of it that's really interesting is um, the uh, just how free enterprise was basically an invented tradition. Um, you know, we we have um, tons of actors uh, in your book talking about how the founding fathers and even Christopher Columbus were free enterprisers. Yeah. Um, so do you, do you want to say something about that? Yeah. I mean, uh, ever since uh, Eric Hobsbawm introduced the term in the early 80s, I think, um, you know, I think historians have been very interested in the idea of invented traditions and to look at their power. And I think free enterprise is a really good example, because as um, I tried to show, it was a term that really wasn't used that often. It was used uh, you know, in these various ways in the 19th century, uh, but really took off um, after the New Deal. Um, and yet people kept talking about the golden age of free enterprise in the past, uh, sometimes in the distant past, you know, with the pilgrims or with, as you mentioned, Columbus, or certainly with the founders. Um, and um, so it was a way of reading present political struggles into the past and sort of trying to find legitimation in history and what helped these people and we may talk about this more uh later on but was that the term was very poorly defined and very vague and so um you know uh you could get away with that and uh, uh what exactly did it mean to say that the founders believed in free enterprise they never used the term um but when you are floating the term that often and are making it common sense then, uh, you know, it's possible to make claims like this. And they repeatedly did, drew, drawing on the lessons of uh, history as they invented it, really. Mm -hmm. 